Welcome to NFL Daily, where we are not psychotic or psychic. I am Greg Rosenthal, and beyond lucky today to be joined right off the top of the show with one of our insiders. It's our weekly insider segment, and this time it's Mike Garofolo. Also, will be joined later in the show. Very excited about this with by Brian Baldinger. But before we do that, it's it's time to talk some news with Mike. He couldn't stand that Ian got the first two spots on NFL Daily, and he, he got first his way. Two. Wow. Yeah. He was available. You know, he was just on on TV that day and available in there. That, that's what we do. He's very unselfish, Ian Rappaport. Um, you know, you guys have a very close, unique relationship. We're going to get to that uh, a little bit later. But I wanted to start the show just doing the news uh, with someone who, who covers it nonstop. So, Randy, hit the drop. Let's do it. News. Surprising bit of training camp. Mike, uh, news on Thursday that Russell Wilson wasn't out there with his calf injury that no one knew about before Thursday. So Justin Fields got out there. He's throwing yeah. pretty deep balls to Van Jefferson. I haven't seen Van Jefferson come down with a deep ball in quite a while, so that was nice. He might be their number two receiver. They don't have much right there. Uh, any long-term concern, maybe not just this injury, but does it get any chance here that, that Justin Fields makes this a battle? I think so. I, Mike Tomlin likes to play the, the the his guys in preseason games. He talks about it. Talked about it last year. You get into an environment like that, it gives you a chance to see how uh, those environments are. It's a dress rehearsal. A lot of coaches are resting guys these days. Uh, Mike Tomlin, very much old school in a lot of ways, wants to play these guys. So Justin Fields is going to play. Russell Wilson is going to play. And what does Justin Fields do when he plays? He does sensational things. Now. We can have a whole separate argument about how he plays the quarterback position. Does he need to win more from the pocket and with his arm and move defenses with his eyes and all that stuff? You can have that conversation. This conversation, uh, which you said, will he make it closer? Yeah, because he's going to get in games and you know what he does, even if he doesn't do it with his arms, even if he does it with his legs. He makes sensational plays. He's going to do that in the preseason. He's going to do that in training camp. And there's going to be uh, a little bit of a temptation for the wow factor that we saw on display when he was with the Bears. Mm. There may be people in the stands clamoring for him. You may get some of those scenes. You know what he's going to do. So, yeah, I think he's going to make it a competition, even though that uh, Russ is in uh, what Tomlin called the pole position, if I recall correctly. Yeah, they, he's been getting all the first team reps, and this mm -hmm. is one of those stories that all the Steelers reporters – push back so hard and they're there and they're talking to people and they're like, this is not a competition. Russ is out there kissing babies at minor league baseball games and he's taking everything and he just is better. And I get all that, but then you get to training camp and the players see these two guys and you mentioned what's happening in the preseason. I just don't think there's that much of a gap between their quarterbacky type skills. They're very similar. Justin Fields is just uh, not as good as Russell Wilson was at that age, but a much younger, faster version with a similar skill set. And you start off training camp with a calf injury. To me, it's a little bit of a concern. Another bit of a surprise, which this has been a little under the radar, Patriots camp, starting with Drake May taking a lot of first team reps. So yeah. also off season long, Gerard Mayo, you know, puts Jacoby Brissett, says it's his job. He's the number one guy and even said that to start camp, but did leave room that, hey, it's a competition. If he outplayed him, then he would have a chance. The fact that on day one, they're already splitting up the reps between May and Brissett as a May fan. Yep. I was like, okay, this is game on. Now I feel like it's 50-50 at worst for me to, to get that job in week one. Yeah, I expected a much different split, and I saw guys uh, out there in New England who are covering the Patriots saying it was, you know, pretty much 50-50, you know, counting the reps and, you know, the stats when you get in the training camp. I always find that funny, but the stats told you how many passes these guys threw, uh, and then there were a couple of tuck and runs from uh, uh, Phil Perry, uh, uh, who covers the Patriots, saying there were some tuck and runs from Drake May as well, so the numbers were pretty much even when it came to snap count. I think that's the most important number in, in uh, Patriots training camp. And you're right. I think uh, that was certainly an indication that maybe that's more of a competition than we thought. I, you know, I did hear some talk that Drake may is needs a little seasoning and maybe needs to sit for a little. I, I don't get that at all. And, and you saw a peek into what he was like in the meetings with the giants hard knocks mm. uh, and the way that he was, uh, 
I think they showed both Indianapolis at the combine and when he was in the building as well. And you saw him breaking down things at the board and able to spit things back. That, that to me showed NFL readiness, you know, from a mental standpoint, you got to now take it and do it on the field. Uh, but to me, I, you know, I, who was I talking to yesterday? I was talking to a Patriots fan yesterday about who their starting quarterback was going to be this year. And I said, I don't know who it'll be to start week one, but I can tell you it'll be Drake May at some point this season. I'm of willing course. to, uh, I'm willing to say that. And I know the the schedule is brutal to start the year. I mean, that's that's just what it is this year for the Patriots. The schedule is going to be tough. He, he's got to play at, at some point. You are around this Eagles team a lot, and yeah. I was very interested in the Jalen Hurts, Nick Sirianni dynamic through last year and even into this offseason. Sometimes when they were at Jalen Hurts, especially asked questions about it, he, he just gave strange sort of plain answers. When he had a chance to give Nick Sirianni some love, he didn't necessarily do it. He was asked about yeah. the reports about the relationship to start training camp. So we're going to listen to him in his opening press conference of camp. I think we're in a great place. You know, I think anytime you have any frustration, anytime you have any, um, any adversity that you have to overcome, it's supposed to test you. Um, and I think it's a matter of being on the same page. You know, and I think if we are on the same page, we maybe would accomplish the things we would have. And, you know, we didn't, but that's a learning, learning mm. experience. Hmm. A little bit of a, I mean, I, I like what he's saying now. He knows they, they both need to be good to, to mm -hmm. be successful. But he, he basically said we, were, we weren't on the same page previously. No, no, no. I, I, I think that's an admission of that right there. Um, and it's certainly what we heard. And I, I extend it to you know, the entire coaching staff, the entire offensive coaching staff and the offensive coordinator, there was definitely, and Brandon Graham flat out said it, um, that their, 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 uh, assistant coaches, I forget how he phrased it, but basically just weren't on the same page between the players and the coaches. So it, it extends beyond Jalen Hurts and Nick Sirianni. It extends to the entire coaching staff needing a reset and they made some changes and they certainly made changes at both coordinator spots. And that to me is the one that I'm most concerned about if I'm the Eagles, not necessarily mm. even Jalen hurts to, to Nick Sirianni, but Jalen hurts to Kellen Moore, who's supposedly coming in with fresh ideas uh, with some skins on the wall as an offensive coordinator, a guy who's got experience. You know, I thought at times last year, I would have questioned some of the uh, things that they were trying to do, particularly in, in, in crunch time and some of those games with the chargers where they just didn't deliver. So, uh, but he's, Certainly got a, a a great offensive mind and the ability to kind of make defenses defend every blade, whatever you know cliche you want to use on that one. But uh, that's what he does, and, and he's good with spacing, and he'll bring in some some motions and some things that we didn't see from a stagnant offense last year. And uh, if you're the Eagles, hopefully that kick starts thing, and and, and, you, and you got a better relationship between your coach and your play caller. You know, I'm sorry, uh, your quarterback and your play a, caller. As a man who's follically challenged, Mike. Mm -hmm. Any annoyance that, you know, Hurts, who has a great hairline, is covering it up there. I mean, he, it, you know, it's hard to not notice him in that tank top. He's he's an impressive looking young man. Yeah. <laughs> he's handsome. I'm willing to say it. I okay. mean, I'll, probably I'm just saying, why handsome, cover that like, thing up? You're, you're, you're that young. Uh, I, know, I know the hat looks good, but, you know. You know, I, I, if, you, if, you've, if you've got <laughs> hair, you've got flexibility, right? If you're... You're like me, you've only got one pitch, and it's not even a fastball. It's an <laughs> EFIS pitch. Um, the Cowboys uh, being thrown some some tough pitches, I would say, at their press conference. Usually, I've been in Oxnard for that opening mm -hmm. press conference. It's like the State of the Union. Everything's great. Everything's exciting. Although there have been holdouts yeah. over the years, and this time, they faced a lot of tough questions. One was to Jerry Jones, and he was asked – if he thought this is going to be Dak Prescott's last year as a member of the Cowboys. So let's listen to that. I, I uh, uh, don't think so. Just to be very specific, I do not think that this will be his last year with the Cowboys at all. Uh, the, the, uh, is there, am I being psychotic, psychotic relative to my mirror? No. No. In my life, I've had a lot of things I wanted that I couldn't get because I couldn't afford it. Come on. Jerry Jones is saying there's a lot of things in his life he couldn't afford. That means there was no price. That's what that means. Whatever he, whatever he wanted, 
Yeah, like a <laughs> Super Bowl. Yeah. That that's yeah, what he can't right. afford. Like, yeah. come on, uh, join join the rest of us. Not 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 empathetic there. And I, they used some funny numbers too. They were like throwing out, oh, it could be seventy five percent of the cap. Like, what are you talking about between between Micah, CD Lamb, yeah. and Dak Prescott? It would not be nearly that much. I mean, they, they're just throwing out some crazy things. Uh, what, what did you take away from this press conference? Another one that, that Stephen Jones threw out there in this, just for context, was that both Micah Parsons and CeeDee Lamb, CeeDee Lamb is the one that's holding out, want to be the highest paid non-quarterback in the NFL. Yeah, and I don't blame CeeDee Lamb for that, but I would say that CeeDee Lamb, uh, Justin Jefferson set that number at 35, and I felt like it was almost time for CeeDee Lamb and Jamar Chase to go, okay, we'll just we'll equal that and we're done, right? Like everybody right there at that happy number of 35, but of course they want to beat the other guy and see if they can get above that. And all, you know, so I get, I get that part of it. Um, they do uh, have some work to do on that one for sure. Uh, they've got work to do on Parsons. Parsons seems like it's not as pressing uh, as CD lamb and certainly holding out creates that you, you, you know, you've got the, ma- the mandatory fines that can be forgiven. Now, if you're on your rookie deal, which CD lamb is so, uh, some players what willing about to, Dak, to though? do you, do you believe him that it'll be, it won't be the last year. That one to me should be I the don't. most pressing. Yeah, I don't, I, well, it, it's, it's, it's not pressing in the sense that you could play out this deal and then try to do something in the spring. And does Dak Prescott want to be the quarterback of the Cowboys? That, that might be the question mm. that we're asking in the spring, mm. right? And maybe now we're asking, because if he did, you know, maybe he wants to get something done, but in the back of his mind, he has to have a plan. And maybe the plan is, I just want to play out the season to maximize my leverage in these contract negotiations. You know, the old bet on yourself. He's not betting on anything. He's got all that money, 160 million plus what he made before that in his pocket. It's not a bet. <laughs> I mean, that's yeah. the safest bet that you could possibly make. So I, I just think with Dak, it's going to have to be a, am I comfortable here? Do I want to continue being mm. here type of thing? It's not a money thing. I don't think. Cause in mm. the end, I, yeah. And, and do, do the Cowboys want to want to continue that? Or are they just giving us lip service when they say, you know, that they, that they want to get this thing done and they feel like it's not going to be his last year with the Cowboys. We'll see. And lip service is a good way to put it. Definitely, you know, following some Cowboys reporters and fans like when they see the, this press conference, they're not buying everything that, that is coming out. And wow, that it's a it's a great way to put it. Does Dak want to be there? There could be some interesting spots next year. We'll see Miami, maybe L.A. even. Who, who knows? Well, uh, now, you know, now you're dabbling into stuff we can't predict right now yes right? <laughs> but know, so, he knows that yeah. things pop up every year so there will be good opportunities for him to make a ridiculous amount of money if he wanted to leave dallas and i will get you out of here mike uh, by bringing up uh, something i brought up to your friend ian uh you know when he was on the show how yeah joe shane watching you guys on nfl network just had a glorious beaming <laughs> smile on his face like man I, he really likes <laughs> Mike Garofalo if you're watching on YouTube you can see the laughter the joy on Joe Shane's face yeah. and I I mentioned it on a on a tweet last week and you had what I guess was a regrettable response yeah. I, I will quote it here sure. um, and it was you responding to uh, to me and you said what can I say busting on rap sheet is something we can all get behind yeah. well um, apparently not phrasing 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 uh and uh you know when you don't think like a kid and you're out out outside of that uh demo you never you, stop you, thinking like a kid then yeah well yeah but <laughs> sometimes you it's you, you're not talking like a kid right and uh apparently that phrasing can mean something else. Uh, so well, I appreciate that, you, Mike, I, not just for coming on today, but you got 213 retweets. You, that, that was viewed hundreds of thousands of times. You helped promote NFL daily. That was your way of doing it. 35 bookmarks really cracked me up that there were 35 people that said, I want to save this for later. <laughs> you know, I'm not a bookmark guy, but that's interesting. Like what would they want to now? The, 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 the uh, make it a quote, right? Uh, which I don't yes, know. Make good. a quote. So, a bunch of people said make it a quote and for maybe even two days i kept getting the i finally had to mute that account because it was like it's sending it back to me like look at this you moron i mean how many people want to put this on a on a board uh but i've got one from uh ian uh that i save that i probably won't even mention here but I'll, i'll i'll send it to you he had a typo in the spring 
Okay. And, uh, so I probably should, I save, I, I told him I was going to make it my Twitter header. Just say it and we'll beep it out if it's really that bad. Come on. You, you, I mean, it just, he was trying to say, he, I'll put it to you this way. <laughs> he was trying to say that everyone loves uh, the quarterback that was drafted by the Falcons eighth overall. And mm, uh, I gotcha. I gotcha. <laughs> the phone decided <laughs> to take it in another direction. Um, which, which, yeah, which is interesting on its own right. Exactly. That, that was the right. autocorrect yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. for Ian. I love it. I, uh, I appreciate you. And, um, look, we'll, we'll never be busted on you, Mike. Thank, thank you for your time. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thanks to Mike Garofolo. I wanted to get to 14 more takeaways as quick as we can, uh, before I get to Brian Baldinger putting Randy Chavez, our great producer up on the screen now to, to keep me company. And yeah, Dak Prescott wanted to get his response to what Jerry Jones said early in the show about whether Dak's going to be on the team next year. At the end of the day, it's a business. And, um, you know, when, uh, uh, I'm going to say, uh, I want to be here, but you know, when you look up, all the great quarterbacks I watched played for other teams. So my point in saying that is, that that's not something to fear. That may be a reality for me one day. May not be my decision. That that pause before he then said, "I'm gonna say it." That said a lot. That said a lot to me. I think Mike Garofalo is on the right track. Does Dak want to be there next year? That is a fascinating uh, story. A couple other contract things. Jamar Chase has quietly not been practicing. It's basically a holding, even though the Bengals are protecting him and saying it's not necessarily a hold and he, he has a plan. It's not a huge deal. He's not practicing. Tua Tunga Vailoa also not practicing. Didn't do anything on Thursday. Practice just doesn't look the same when, when Skylar Thompson is splitting the reps with, with Mike White. So something to watch there. Joe Burrow has been on fire at Bengals camp. That's my, my third note here. And it's one of those stories that you hear enough people say how his arm looks better and how he really looks different that I am starting to believe it. Let's listen to Joe Burrow. Yeah, I, I was happy with today. Uh, you know, still feeling it out. You know, still have have some throws where it's it's like, well, what did that look like? Uh, it usually goes where I want it to, but sometimes it doesn't spin the way I want it to. So we're still working through that. Uh, but I feel really good about where I'm at. I feel like I uh, kind of figured something out towards the end of the practice there in individual. So. Um, looking forward to exploring that a little more. I love that. Looking forward to exploring it more. Randy, this is a guy who's accomplished a lot, but he's talking about a early training camp practice where he thinks he found something late in practice and he's going to work on his craft more. That's like, it's like you with your editing skills, you with trying to house train your cats. You never give up. Never give up. That's the key. Consistency is always the most important thing. And I'm, I'm serious that the hype that's going around with Burrow that, his arm, he was never really healthy last year that he's had a strong start. This is maybe the training camp we've we've always been looking for, for him to have a fully healthy August and in July. And I'm getting excited about it. All right, let's play the music now, Randy. And I'm going to try to roll through the final 10 points. Number four, uh, the Bills are going with five receivers with Josh Allen for the most part. Keon Coleman's at the X. Khalil Shakir is inside. Curtis Samuel's doing a lot. And then you have MVS and Mac Collins. I think they're going to play two tight ends a lot, but those are their guys. And look, Shakir might be their number one in the end if it's not one of the tight ends. I also want to shout out to Mac Collins. Uh, Josh Allen said, I love Mac. He's one of the all-time greats. This dude just must be one of the best dudes in the world. Every team Mac Collins is on, he's like a great clubhouse guy, Randy. He's like you. Everyone just like talks about him. Just like, I love Mac Collins. He's doing something right. I, I I like to wear shoes though. I heard he's a, a big like yes. no shoe guy. So. He is he is kind of a an odd bird that way. Another Bills note that this is my next one. Demar Hamlin started training camp with the starters. I know he, people were mad he didn't get that comeback player of the year award last year. If he actually is starting this year and makes a big impact, we'll see. They're testing that out. Cole Bishop, the rookie, Mike Edwards will also get looks, but. Demar Hamlin practicing. Matt Milano also practicing fully coming off the torn ACL for the Bills. That's big news. Von Miller says he should have never played last year, but he supposedly looks better at camp. We'll see, but it's early promising signs. He's getting some first team reps that he's a little more recovered from that torn ACL. Speaking of which, some downer news. My next note, uh, two big injuries, torn ACLs, season enders. Makai Blackman, the good second year cornerback for the Vikings, and then Darion Kendrick, a third year cornerback for the Rams. You, you hate to see that. The Vikings were already very thin 
at the position. I think Blackman was, was going to start. They are a team to me that could really pick someone up, a Stefan Gilmore, because they need help. I don't think the Rams are, are going to do that. I wouldn't say Kendrick, who started a lot the last two years, was in their top three. It's probably Darius Williams, Tredavious White, uh, Kobe Durant ahead of Kendrick anyways, but you still feel uh, for a young player like that. The Seahawks gave a surprising deal to Julian Love, their safety. I don't know if they're just really into the top 100 list or something. Three years, $36 million. Was this necessary? He, he was under contract. To me, it's a sign John Schneider, their GM, who, who brought Love in. He's got the juice right now. He's got as much juice, and he's using it to sign his guys. Uh, here are some guys, Randy, who's looking good at practices early, and then I'm buying it, that they're thinner, they're just fresher. Marlon Humphrey, cornerback of the Ravens. Rashad Bateman, the hype is real. He's making plays play after uh, day after day. Debo Samuel, uh, everyone says, just looks a little sharper, a little thinner. And then Javante Williams, I always say it's the second year for running backs after tor a torn ACL, and he's looking better for the Broncos. Sean Payton giving him some love. Uh, some depth chart notes in Philadelphia I found interesting. This is my 10th note. Quinion Mitchell, the first round pick, fourth right now at best at that outside cornerback on the depth chart behind Keely Ringo, behind Isaiah Rodgers, and Eagles fans will be like, this is what they do. They bring rookies along slowly. I get it, but those two players, Ringo and Rodgers, supposedly had great off seasons before this and now they're using Mitchell at the nickel position playing inside which I, I think he could do it's a way to get him on the field Cooper DeGene's also hurt right now so something to watch there also James Bradbury is a backup safety there that's wild to me uh, my next note is on the same team at linebacker Zach Bond actually ahead of Nicobe Dean at linebacker so Saints fans out there you know what I'm gonna say the bonfire it's raging again. It could still happen. A uh, couple final notes. 49ers rookie running back Isaac Garendo, uh, hamstring injury first day at camp. One of those fantasy sleepers we watched with some freaky athleticism. That's never a good sign. It's also tough to know, my next one, what to make of injury reports this time of year. But when you look at the Browns players who are sidelined, it's, it's all their best players, a lot of them. Nick Chubb, Jedrick Wills. Jack Conklin. So there's your two safeties and then Chubb. And then Dalvin Tomlinson is getting knee surgery and Greg Newsom, their starting cornerback, is now getting hamstring surgery and may not be ready for week one. If they're getting surgeries now, they were hoping to avoid it. And so that's bad news. Finally, last one and we get out of here. Chris Ballard, the GM of the Colts, was asked you know, to pump up some players and he really didn't want to. And then finally he said, Jonathan Taylor will have a big year. That's where I'll stop. His words. That's where I'll stop too, at least before the break. If if Ballard's saying that, Taylor might be one of those post-type all-stars we talked about with Patrick Darty. Let's take a quick break and we'll be back on the other side. Wrap up the week with Brian Baldinger. I am so excited to be wrapping up week three here on NFL Daily. Uh, with one of the most respected, let's let's face it, best looking, best lives in the entire game, Brian Baldinger, coming straight off a plane from Italy. Your Instagram, Baldy, <laughs> was all pro elite. I, I apologize for the come down that is that is coming onto a computer <laughs> with me just days <laughs> after you get off that plane. Yeah, well, it is a uh, it is you know I mean you're living. The very best life for for anybody that goes to Italy. I you know I I would tell most people, Greg, like Rome is not the place to go in July. It just isn't. Mm. But you have to pay your respects. You can't go to Italy and not pay your respects at the altar of Saint Peter's or you know pick a pick a location, the Colosseum. So you know we did that and ended up in Sardinia, and that's just a hard place to leave. It's just it's just that, <laughs> it's just the quality of life is just that good. <laughs> And now we're going to be just talking offensive lines. But yeah, check out Baldy on Instagram because, I mean, I know you were in Rome a little bit, but you were also in the water. Wherever Baldy goes, the water yeah. is not not far away. Uh, I actually want to bring up something that was on your Instagram earlier in this off season, And I'm going to do it. I'm surprising you here, Baldy, okay. by setting up a brand new segment here on NFL Daily. W will we ever get you back again to do it? I don't know, but we're going to do it one time. Right. And the segment is called Crystal Baldy. And okay. it is based on an astoundingly good prediction you made before the draft. So we're going to have our listeners listen oh. to something you said before the draft. This is Baldy's analysis from the pool. Just got done my morning swim. I know they signed Kirk Cousins to a big deal. And Kirk Cousins can be fine. 
but I feel Atlanta is in the market for a quarterback. Every mock draft I used to look at, Atlanta's going defense. I feel like the Atlanta Falcons are in the market for a quarterback. This is the year to do it. They got Kirk Cousins there. Nobody they draft has to play right away. They've got a caretaker, maybe more than a caretaker. But I feel like the Atlanta Falcons are in are shopping. And they're going to be shopping for a quarterback. And that's what this morning's analysis is all about. Let's shake it up. I feel like the Falcons are going for the eighth pick in the 2024 NFL draft. The Atlanta Falcons select. Michael wow. Penix Jr. Well, there it is. Wow. Washington. Wow. That is the first surprise hey, now. of the NFL draft, to say the least. There it was. Baldy. They, they, I, I heard all the draft analysts yeah. after that. They said, no one th- saw this coming. No one. You know who saw it coming? Crystal Baldy from the pool. You're doing better yeah. work at the pool than people are doing in the lab. <laughs> you know, it's interesting, Greg. <clears throat> I met uh, Michael Penix Jr. and his agent at the Super Bowl this year. And I, I'd watched the championship game, and I'd watched the game against Texas, and I'd watched them. I didn't really study them yet. And then the more I studied them, the more I liked them. And then – I worked for the Falcons. I did their preseason games for when Mike Smith first got there. And, you know, Matt Ryan was drafted. And I just remember, and I've known Arthur Blank for a long time. And the only time, this is not any offense to anybody else, but the only times the Falcons have ever been relevant in recent history is when Michael Vick was there and Matt Ryan was there. Now, maybe Kirk Cousins changed that. But I just felt like, okay, I know they gave Kirk a bunch of money, but I knew. Once mm. they saw and met Michael Penix Jr., that they were going to fall in love with the kid. Like the person, the man, um, the competitor. Um, and they just have to get past the medical whatnot. But I don't know. It just hit me that day that this is not going to surprise me. It might surprise everybody else, but it wasn't going to surprise me. I mean, I wish I had seen that at the time because it did. I absolutely did not hear anyone else say that. Before we get to what's going to be your crystal baldy prediction here, and you're you're one for one. You you hit a thousand. You're Shohei Otani hitting the four hundred and seventy <laughs> feet right now. You got a lot to live up to. I am curious because Kirk Cousins, you know, they started training camp in Atlanta today while we're on the topic, and they said he'll be a little limited maybe in some aspects in, in training camp coming off a of torn Achilles, but he's he's cleared to to be on the field. You you watch Penix a lot. I guess I'm curious what, how you think that is going to go this year between Cousins and Penix. Not that it's an open competition, just how you, how you think it could shake out. Well, you know, regardless of what gets reported, Greg, like, you know, there's a report, and then there's the players that see a player play every day. Like, I, I'd be surprised if the defensive backs in Atlanta, you know, and they've got a lot of really, you know, good players back to A.J. Terrell. Like, they, they're going to see Michael Penix's arm. The receivers mm. are going to see what he's like, whether um, he's taking first team reps or not. They're all going to see, I think, what I've seen, and I think what the bra- the upper crust of the brass of, of the Atlanta Falcons saw. They're going to see a really talented arm. And well, Kirk Cousins is an elite decision maker. He's been a proven you know guy that can play at a high level. Um, I, I I think that they're going to. See the talent that Michael Penix is. And the thing that I remember when I talked, I had him on a podcast, Greg. So, um, you know, he had, he'd had like, and I was, you know, we were getting ready for the combine and some private workouts and whatnot. I said, so are you going to run like in the low four sixes? Or are you going to run in the high four fives? And he just scoffed at it. And he goes, I'm in the four fours. Ooh. And like, we didn't see him run a lot, you know? And, but he's got, you know, like Anthony Richardson type speed. Like, he might be the second or third. I mean, I don't know what Lamar is or what Kyler is, but he's going to be not very far from those guys when he has to take off and, and salvage a play. And that's something, you know, that Kirk's never going to have to do. And, he, he you know, fortunately, he, he built his career around just being able to make the right reads and getting the ball out quick. That is fascinating because, yeah, I haven't really thought about how that's different. And, look, he doesn't have the wiggle of some of those, those top guys. Maybe he's closer True. to, like, a Daniel Jones where yeah, yeah. if he has a seam, he can go hit it. You're right. But I, I think that's fascinating because I, I always say Kirk Cousins is not quite the guy people think he is in the sense that – He's not always the number 12 quarterback in the league or wherever you want to slot him. He is extremely streaky. He has 
five to six games in every season where he looks like an MVP candidate, but he also has bad streaks too. He can be up and down, so he, he wants to avoid some of those bad streaks to start the year coming off a of torn Achilles. All right, enough on the Falcons. I do want to get to what's your crystal baldy prediction for NFL Daily that we're going to play back to you next time you come on if you ever do uh, you know, grace us with your presence again, Baldy. Well, Greg, I will definitely come back. Um, if invited, I will come back. I know this is not going to make any sense to anybody, but I, I just feel like it's the, the history of the Jets say there's no way, just the history of the Jets, they're going to screw it up. That's their history. Hassan Reddick, I mean, he's not in camp. Like, how do you not get that deal done the day of the draft? Anyways, um, I just feel like this is a talented team, a t- really talented defense, uh, really deep. The offensive line is all predicated upon how healthy they stay, and that's that's not going to be an easy thing to predict um, with their history of you know Tyron Smith and even Morgan Moses last year and Aaron Rodgers with his four snaps last year. I just feel like – the Jets are going to deliver. That's why they're on the front. Mm. That's why they're going to be. That's why they are front loaded on primetime games just to see. And then maybe they can back load it if they do get streaky and get hot and play to their talent level. I mean, they won a seven games last year somehow with the quarterback play that was just dreadful. Um, just dreadful. And they, you know, and then the defense collapsed at the end because they just, you can't win games if you don't score points. They couldn't score any points. I think with Brees and Garrett and Michael Williams and what they have offensively, they should be good and they should be very good defense. I, mm. This has never played with the lead, Greg, ever. So in recent history, so you give this defense, give Sauce and DJ and give give this pass rush a lead in the fourth quarter, those Jet fans aren't going to know what to do at MetLife Stadium. <laughs> so you're, you're liking the over, which is nine and a half wins. I know we're not doing – over unders here, but you, right. you are no, feeling I like big. Over. I, I like him over. Now, obviously, if something happens to Aaron, it's probably going to fall apart. I mean, nothing against Tyrod Taylor, but it's probably not going to go if he if he misses any amount of time, or if their left tackle falls down. But they drafted a left tackle to be his replacement. I mean, I, I feel like they've got better depth up front on the offense line at, from any point that since Joe Douglas has been there and Robert Sala has been there. I think they got better depth if th- something does happen to one of their marquee starters so okay. i feel like they're in better shape to protect aaron than they have bullish been. bullish on the jets i gotta say you know the the videos are now out from aaron Rodgers' first practice literally the first throw of training camp was 40 yards down the field i forget who it was too might have been alan probably lazard Garrett Wilson. Probably it, was Garrett Garrett Wilson. it was a dime and i'm thinking okay i guess i spent all off season doubting the achilles because i don't know man a 40 year old coming off an achilles and we'll see but that that got me back on board of like okay this i i'm with you i think i think they're they're going to make the playoffs i think the bills are still a lot to deal with but i i think those two teams are going to be really good well i'm sure that that aaron Rodgers throw that made it social media i haven't seen it yet I mean, they love those slow motion NFL films throws. <laughs> exactly. And it looks like, you know, the spiral is super tight and it takes eight seconds of, you know, your breath away and it lands perfectly in the fingertips of one of those. I'm sure that's the shot. Um, but we saw that all off season last year, you know, and, you know, we all just got crushed, you know, four plays into that game against Buffalo. Yeah, he's going to have to get get rid of the ball. He's not he's not 30 years old like he used to be in Green Bay where he would hold and kind of figure it out. He's going to have to get rid of the ball, but man, they have so much talent and I'm with you. I want to you, you mentioned the Jets offensive line. With the time we have left uh, with you, Baldy, I want to do a little offensive line talk. Obviously, the most important thing that determines winning and losing that the, the average Joes, I did throw myself in there, understand the least and, and it's also very hard to predict. It's like a it's like a bullpen. You know, some t- you, you could have a great bullpen one year. You didn't know it was coming, and suddenly you're going to the World Series. If you could have a great offensive line one year that you didn't see coming, suddenly it's going to a, the, the Super Bowl. I'm going to throw out a few different groups, and you can just tell yeah. me who you want to talk about. I'm going to start with the AFC contenders because, to me, I still put the Ravens, Bills, Bengals, Chiefs because of their quarterbacks, because of what they've done the last four years in a tier above the rest. And a lot of changes in Baltimore with their offensive line. Bills, I think, have a nice continuity, underrated. Uh, the Bengals added a lot of size this year with, with Trent Brown and Marius Mims. And then the Chiefs, 
very good except left tackles up for grabs. Just out of those four teams, what which one is the most interesting to you in terms of their offensive line that they could make either make or break their season? Well, I mean, look, the Ravens lost three starters, okay? And so you you know, you lose uh, you know, you lose your Zeitler, you lose Moses, you lose your left guard, uh, you know, to the Jets. That's a lot. But I, I've been saying this, and I, I say, sort of say it tongue-in-cheek, but, you know, the Ravens restock offensive linemen the way Walmart restocks shells. I mean, that, that's what they do. I mean, Andrew Voorhees was drafted at a USC, would have probably been a second or third-round pick last year, but he tore his ACL. And so he basically redshirted last year. He's going to go play left guard for John Simpson. They drafted Rosengarten to play right tackle. Maybe he wins the job. Maybe he doesn't. Um, Good you know, Rosen representation. Hasn't been a lot of Rosen. I mean, Josh Rosen is gone, but Mike Rosenthal, former Vikings tackle representing. I mean, you know, I, I represent yeah, the yeah, Rosen. Yeah, yeah. I got you. you know, the tribe is out there. Um, you know, <laughs> Rogers. Uh, so, you know, but Ben Cleveland was drafted four years ago. Um, you know, big countries there. They draft, you know, basically – an all pro center, you know, when they did draft, uh, you know, Linderbaum, uh, we'll see if Stanley t- stays healthy, but you know, they always have a guy like Patrick McCarry that can plug in and play anywhere. Um, I feel like the Ravens are good, you know, and then obviously I think Derrick Henry is going to make a difference so, and mm. they're well coached. D'Alessandro, uh, the offense line coach is very good. Like, I feel like they're going to get back and run the ball like the way they've always run the ball with Lamar. Okay, they they always look better too at the end of the year than the beginning, and with new pieces. And yeah, that's a sign of great coaching. I saw, I saw they had three hundred and eighty pound Daniel Falele uh, yeah. playing at guard. So I just for my own interest, I hope that happens sometime during the season. That would be fun. I'm gonna throw out now another list of teams who I think are candidates to be like sneaky good. Maybe go up to the to the top of the league of the offensive line. Maybe people aren't thinking about them as much. Tell me which one you like the best. You you mentioned the Jets, so let's not hit that again. But they have they have some potential. The Packers, the Colts, who have been good, the Chargers after drafting Joe All, and then the Falcons, who have had nice continuity. Maybe one of those teams you think could just really be elite and set up an elite offense. Packers, Colts, Chargers, Falcons. Well, I'm going to go Chargers. I mean, I think Joe All is going to you know he's going to be there. I, I saw Rashawn Slater um, at OL Masterminds. Like he's just he just has elite ability since the day he stepped on the field. I mean, if you give the Chargers bookend tackles, they've drafted a bunch of guys over the last few years, Zion, you know, Johnson, different guys. Um, like, I just feel like the Chargers, because of their commitment to the run game, I think the commitment to the pistol formation, like they're going to develop an offense line. I, I don't think Harbaugh knows any other way to coach, mm. but to start right where you're talking about right now, and build this thing because it hasn't been very good. They couldn't run the ball at all the last three years. Um, and so I, I feel like the commitment was there. They could have gone a lot of different ways with that early first round pick they had. And they went Joe Walt, which made a ton of sense. Um, I feel like he's, I knew his dad really well. Um, I know the player. Harbaugh tried to recruit him to go to Michigan. He lost to Notre Dame in that battle. He wasn't going to lose again. I feel like this, this could be, a much improved and a very good offensive line. Offensive linemen are, are just built different. I, uh, I'll get you out on this, Baldy. I'll give you one last group of teams. The, the, the offensive line here that concerns you the most, that could get in the way of the, this team, you know, I- improving, being where they want to be. I'll throw out the Seahawks, the Saints, the Commanders, and the Jags. Just uh, is there one team there that that worries you a little bit going into the season? Seahawks, Saints, Commanders, Jags. Well, the Saints have not been able to put. We don't know what's going on with Ryan Ramchek. I don't know if you have any updates. I mean, he, I mean he's not playing this year, and yeah. Dennis Allen hasn't ruled out that he could return in another year, but he's not playing this year. So, I mean, they're really look. It did not work, um, you know, at all uh, when they drafted a left tackle and Trevor Penning. Now, I'm not. Sh- Trevor Penning is an elite athlete. He's not played well. His They're trying him at well. right tackle is the, the new thing. They're trying and he him. Came, he came to OL Masterminds. He was there. Uh, met Trevor. I had met, not met him before. They got a new offense line coach, new way of doing things down there. John Benton's down there, you know, running the offense, kind of a um, kind of like a, a Shanahan-style offense now being run in uh, in New Orleans, which might be helpful to him. But I think Fuaga 
is going to be a really good player. We'll, we'll see. Sometimes there's growing pains there. But, you know, they're, they're, they're a group that have not been able to put together. Their offense has struggled. The running game has struggled. Uh, Derek Carr has, not, has taken a lot of hits. He played hurt a lot last year. Um, they have not been able to put together a great line the way uh, Sean Payton did for a lot of years mm. there in New Orleans. And so it's a concern because they're counting on these two young guys to man the corners and the edges in, in Penny and Fuaga. And one guy has struggled. Maybe he'll be better in a new system. And the other guy's going to be a rookie. And sometimes it takes a little bit of time to figure out this league. Yeah, they uh, coaching matters a lot. We talked about Clint Kubiak coming in, and, and that's their their best hope because y- you said it. For all the all the ways they miss Sean Payton, and there are many with the quarterbacks and play callings, like the offensive line play just went right down. And and that's uh, – that, that's what it's all about. It's it's guys in the trenches. I mean, someone should hire you one of these days, but then you'd have to give up on this lifestyle. Yeah. I, I think you have it better off this way, Baldy. Lifestyle is going to win out every time, Greg. <laughs> it's, it's won out for the last 30 years. It's going to continue to win out. I, uh, I, I got to balance it up a little bit. I love it. Uh, lifestyle winning out here. You, you, you make our lifestyle better here. And, and we're wrapping up the week with you, Baldy. So okay. Randy, let, let's hit the music. Appreciate everyone for, for listening this week. Yeah. I may be, I may be messed up my lifestyle committing to this daily show. Daily's <laughs> different, but it's a daily lot of fun. Too. And I, I'm really having fun with this show in training camp. So we're going to be back next week. We're going to visit a couple training camps until then. We'll see you on Monday.